Thank you for joining us for our fourth town hall. We have already hosted Dominique Anglade, Colin Standish, and Eric Duhem. Tonight, our guest is Balarama Holness of Block Montreal. Welcome, Mr. Holness, and thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank I you. should point out that we are disappointed that the leaders of the three other parties, Coalition Avenir, <laughs> Coalition Avenir Quebec, the Parti Québécois and Quebec Solidaire have declined. Little technical glitch here. Okay. Uh, have declined our invitation to meet with our community. To date, only the liberals have responded to our questions. The answers are posted on our website. I remind you that we submitted a list of questions to all parties and we asked for their responses. We urge the other parties to follow suit and to submit their answers as soon as possible. Our other mission is to urge English speaking Quebecers to have their voices heard at the ballot box. With election day four weeks away, I wish to remind community members of key dates. You have from between September 12 and 29, which has already begun obviously, to ensure you are on the electoral list. The advanced polls are on September 25 and 26. And of course, election day is on Monday, October 3rd. As part of our get out the vote effort, we are launching a social media campaign. We are asking community leaders to tape short videos, no more than 30 seconds, to make their case for why it's critical to vote and to have your voice heard. We are asking them to post their videos on their own social media platforms and to use the hashtag, hashtag Anglo's voice vote or hashtag vote it up. Now, before turning the evening once again over to our moderator, Royal Orr, I would like to begin by acknowledging that the Quebec Community Groups Network and its member organizations carry out their activities on partially unceded lands and territories, which were the traditional homes and gathering places for many indigenous nations whose presence here reaches back to time immemorial. The QCGN acknowledges our First Nations, that they have a long and rich history of occupation and stewardship of these lands that long served as a site of meeting and exchange among nations. The QCGN's recognition and respect for the history of the First Nations, Inuit and Métis people is an important step towards building trust and creating and renewing relationships with contemporary Indigenous peoples and communities. And now I'll turn it over to Royal. Thanks very much, Ava. And thanks to everybody for joining us this evening. Our guest tonight is obviously Balarama Holness, leader of Bloc Montréal, a Grey Cup champion with the Montreal Alouettes and a lawyer. He ran for Borough Mayor of Montreal North for Projet Montréal in the 2017 Montreal municipal elections. And he ran for Mayor of Montreal in the municipal election a year ago. He formed Bloc Montréal several months ago, and his party is running candidates in a number of ridings in the city. So before asking Mr. Holness to speak, let me give you a brief outline of how we're going to function this evening. Mr. Holness will have 10 minutes for opening remarks. We'll then engage in a conversation with him for about 40 minutes. The discussion to be divided into the following topics, rights and access to justice, education, health and social services, and the vitality of Quebec's English speaking community. Those of you listening in are encouraged to suggest questions for Ms. Mr. Holness in the Q&A function. What we're gonna be asking you to do is when we're on a specific topic, send us your question for that topic. Uh, we'll, build, uh, we'll, we'll put them into the mix as much as we can um, and uh, then move on to the next topic, at which point we'll invite you to give us your questions about education, health and social services or whichever topic we're covering at that point. Please note that all attendees were automatically muted as they entered the event. You will not have the option to turn on mics or video cameras. We're asking everybody to keep their questions and 
Mr. Holness, your answers as brief as possible so we can get to as many of them as possible. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please send an email to events at qcgn.ca. That's events at qcgn.ca if you're having some technical difficulties. So now let's turn to Balarama Holness for your opening remarks. Welcome, Mr. Holness. Uh, thank you so much, first of all, for the um, introduction and the warm welcome. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, a pleasure to be back um, in, this, in this election. As you many of you may know, I ran for mayor of Montreal in 2021. <clears throat> and before I jump into our policies, I want to give you some insight into who I am. <clears throat> Excuse me, because many of you... Um, you, you might have seen me on the news or read our platform, but you don't really know a lot about myself and, and where I'm from. I want to take you back um, to 1979. My father, a Jamaican man from the rolling hills of St. Elizabeth, Jamaica, who immigrated to Montreal in 1969, meets my mother, a French Canadian woman from the east of Montreal, in 79 at the Forum of Montreal at a Bob Marley concert. Um, and as you know, a few year, a year later, we would have a referendum. And the tension in Montreal at the time was, was quite extreme. Um, we were finishing off when my father first arrived here, uh, the end of the Quiet Revolution and moving into a new Quebec, if you will, that was focused on not just secularism, but strong language laws. And when we fast forward up until right now, 2022, we find ourselves having the same challenges, the same divisions in our society, uh, whether it's language, we've seen it through Bill 96, whether it's through Bill 21, and uh, this idea that public servants should not wear religious symbols. We've, we're experiencing a society in many ways that, are, that is more fractured th than ever. And that is why I decided to run in this provincial election, was because the same issues that were <clears throat> at the forefront of society when my parents met in 79 are the same issues that we're dealing with right now. And unfortunately, if we don't take concrete action, we are, the next generation is also going to be dealing with these, with these issues. Now, well beyond language and culture, Montreal is a very unique metropolis within Quebec, and we know Quebec is unique within Canada. And that uniqueness needs to be recognized. And that's why Bloc Montreal, we are the only party that says something very, very simple, is that we want to have more autonomy and more political independence for Montreal. And our first, I would say, very clear policy on that is to say that 20% of the provincial tax that's generated in Montreal stay in Montreal. And this is very moderate, right? We, we could easily say 100% or 50%. But right now um, in Montreal, that would provide us with $2 billion additional uh, in our in, in our treasure box, if you will. And right now, and I see some of, uh, we have some elected officials here, Sonny and a few others. The big challenge with our metropolis is that we do not have the economic means to deal with issues such as, and let's uh, touch on another core part of our policy, which is the housing crisis. Right now, 24,000 people waiting for social housing. The pandemic has exacerbated issues when it comes to homelessness. The number is ranges between four to ten thousand. It's hard to put a number on it, but homelessness is is a is a is a critical issue. And affordability, as we know, the cost of living is going through the roof. And that's why we want to ensure that we build enough affordable and social housing. We, we're promising twenty four thousand social housing units within the first five years, um, within the first four years rather of, of a mandate. And that's something that we deeply care about. Now, immigration, let's move on to uh, another key aspect of our uh, platform. Immigration is critical because it touches on all the issues that we discuss, which is basically uh, language, religion, culture, and identity. And right now, one of the big issues 
is that we have a government that is literally rupturing fam families by not allowing family reunification. Quebec has jurisdiction over a large portion of immigration. And right now, family reunification is being fought over. And Black Montreal is advocating for a more compassionate and humanitarian approach uh, to immigration. And we want to ensure that we allow families uh, to unite to ensure that we're not barring that unification um, through language. I'm not going to go through our whole platform, and we're going to have time throughout um, the talk, but I, I will conclude on this in my opening remarks, is that we're coming to a point in which I think our democracy is being put into question. We have often heard of this idea of vote splitting, of taking away from the liberals, and what I would like for each voter to do is take a look at our platform in depth. And we'll have the time throughout this whole talk to, to look at that platform and imagine for a moment, and I'm a grade eight teacher as, as well as, I don't have my, my bar by the way. So after I did law school, I jumped right into politics. But imagine being in a civics course and telling young people well, the way democracy works is that if you're a small group of people and you're going up against these behemoths, these institutional um, political entities, well, they should not run because they're going to take power away from the larger group. And this is what, this is the rhetoric that we've been hearing, whether it's the media or whether it's even voters and largely pushed by the media, is that the smaller parties are going to eat away at the larger parties. But that's what that's what healthy democracy is. So I encourage you all throughout this talk to ask tough questions, have an open mind, analyze our platform, analyze the the responses that I give to your questions. And let's start voting with our values and truly allow democracy to breathe in this election and give a chance and give a voice to those who are often not heard and not allow the major parties to simply monopolize our votes um, just for the sake of their branding. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holness. Let me remind you, our conversation this evening is going to focus around four broad themes. These are themes that QCGN has established as of particular importance to the English speaking community. And they're the themes that we have addressed with the other leaders who have joined us already. So this is the format we've adopted. Once again, we'd love to have your questions for Mr. Holness. Use the Q&A function to, uh, to send those to us. And we're starting with the topic of rights and access to justice. So Mr. Holness, I, I, I dug a little bit into your website this afternoon and you're very clear in terms of rights and access to justice, specifically about Bills 21 and 96. You say they should be gone. Get rid of them. Um, specifically, if you're elected or you have a couple of people elected from your party, as that kind of a small group of people in the National Assembly, what do you do to get rid of Bill 96 and Bill, 90, Bill 21 when you probably, no, not probably, you will not have power, you will not yeah. control the National Assembly. So what do you do about 96 and 21 with only a couple of people elected? Yeah, so first of all, that's a, that's a great question. And let's for a moment speak about access to justice, right? So in the Canadian Constitution, Article uh, 133 establishes that any and all Canadian, you have the right in front of a court, in front of any judicial procedure to have services in both English and in French. Okay, this is enshrined in the Canadian Constitution. So even though Bloc Montreal might not have a majority in government, we can still advance public dialogue. And Justice Rowe, who came to speak uh, to McGill Law students when I was there, talked about the importance of advancing public dialogue and allowing all Montrealers, including Francophones, to understand that this is an infringement, not just on the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, but on the Quebec Charter of Human Rights and Freedoms. And a Superior Court judge has recently struck down, I believe it was that particular element of Bill 96, saying that it would limit access to, to, to justice. So you do not need a majority within um, the National Assembly to begin to 
tear down the walls of Bill 96. Now you are right, the complete removal and abolishment of Bill 96 um, is not possible. However, um, the liberal government wants to only amend four, uh, the liberal team rather, wants to only amend four um, aspects of Bill 96 and simply remove the notwithstanding clause. So what we're establishing and we're advocating for, and we want all Montrealers to vote in that regard. And that's how, if this was post-election, it'd be a different answer, but we are in an election and every single one of you in this chat room and everyone who's going to be listening to this recording in the future can vote for a party that wants to completely abolish it from A to Z. And it is only right now, according to the polling, one party that's gonna have a majority and everyone else is gonna have to fight for every vote and earn every vote, but that does not mean that we cannot stand up for our rights on issues such as Bill 96 or Bill 21. Okay, let's just remind people we're taking your questions about uh, rights and access to justice for Balarama Wholeness from uh, Bloc, uh, Bloc Montréal. Uh, use the Q&A function to do that. And when you send us your question, please also include your name and where you're writing from, just so we have a sense of who we're talking to. But uh, that's open. Send those to us and we'll pass them along to Mr. Wholeness. Um, you, you touched quickly on the charters and the notwithstanding clause. Uh, one of the things I think from this last CAC government that surprised people was their willingness to basically set aside the charter um, and, and, and to not seek a broad consensus to do that. Uh, are you prepared to take some steps to, in effect, protect the charter, especially the Quebec charter, from a simple majority of the National Assembly altering it um, or setting it aside in the way it's been set aside with both Bill 21 and 96? Well, and that's a great question. When the Canadian Constitution was negotiated, the way, and, and the charter rather was negotiated, the way that we got all provinces on board is to put this notwithstanding clause. However, it was only supposed to be used in the most extreme of circumstances. And right now, what's happening is that we have a provincial government that is using the notwithstanding clause preemptively before it even gets to the courts in a way that is reckless. And that was not the intention of Article 33 of the notwithstanding clause when it was initially uh, established with um, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So this is the conundrum that we're in. This is the difficulty that, that is upon us, whereby we have a government that is simply literally amending our constitution like it was a Google Doc. But these are the fundamental freedoms and values that are dear to us. And I want to give you one clear example. Um, Article S7, life, liberty, security. When you are a patient going to see your physician and you cannot get services in English, for example, and you need quality information that is going to impact your health, well, that could affect life, liberty, and security. There are also all kinds of other rights that are infringed upon, and we won't go into depth, but just to give you an example, now your contract, whether it's, a, it's to own a home, the most important expense you're going to have in your life, you will not be able to have that in the language of, of your choice or in English, rather. So that would be extremely detrimental to the, to the um, economic and, and to the, the freedoms of all Quebecers. And I want to point out that it's not just Anglophones and Allophones that are against Bill 96. More and more Francophones, particularly students who no longer have a choice of whether to go to English or French CEGEP are also standing up against Bill 96. So while we can't, we don't have all the power at the National Assembly, we still have the people on the ground that are pushing back against 21 and 96. Okay, we've got a question from Sylvia from Montreal. She asks, would you say you're against some parts of Bill 101, the Charter of the French Language? If so, which parts? Et donc, je ne suis pas contre la loi 101 et c'est pour ça que, en tant que parti, as a party, we're very different from other parties that, that are out there. Um, I, I might lose some votes on this, but I'm, I'm going to say we are for Bill 101. And I think the importance of speaking French in Montreal, and I think most Anglophones agree that the French language and the beauty of the French language is what makes Montreal unique also. That's what differentiates us from uh, Toronto and other areas of the world. So the reason why I speak French and I was able to access democracy in the way that 
I have over the last um, few years is because of Bill 101. Mm -hmm. And I think that we should be open to ensuring that and as a parent, I, I hope today I was at my child, Bella, baby Bella's daycare saying, does she have French classes? Be but there are no French classes in her daycare. She goes to McGill daycare. I think that we should maintain Bill 101. Imagine an attempt to open Bill 101, the, the increased divisiveness that that's going to cause. And it would cause the same, if not more than Bill 96. That would make us somewhat hypocritical if we started saying, hey, let's abolish Bill 101. We'd be doing the same thing Cross the Bill's doing and dividing um, our, our, our province. So we are at Block Montreal for maintaining uh, Bill 101 as is. However, we are also for expanding uh, Dawson College, ensuring that you have choice once you get to Sejep and that you have access to quality universal education across the board. And I would add for those parents who their children is, are going to English school. We're also advocating for quality bilingual uh, education so that when your son or daughter does finish an English high school, well, they had quality French courses and they're able to interact at a high level um, with the French language across the board. <laughs> Okay. Thank you for your question. So, 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 so I think, I think you've actually been touching on the substance of this next question, but <clears throat> this sharpens it a little bit. And so I, interesting challenge for you. Anna from Dorval says, can you summarize your own thinking and position on the French language and minority language rights? How, what, what's, what's the balance that you want to, you want to establish between support and promotion of the French language, but respect for minority language rights? And that's a great question. And the simple, easy answer is this idea of multiculturalism versus interculturalism. The way that we view it is that French, English, Italian, Spanish, you name it, all of these languages are able to interact and engage. And that's what creates the social fabric of our beautiful community. We also have to take into consideration, in, we spoke about it at the beginning on the territory, indigenous language, indigenous rights. Mm -hmm. But we are one of the few places in the world that have these battles. And I think that when we start recognizing the value of French, the value of Molière, and I even did theater <laughs> when I was a young boy in grade eight, Le Bourgeois Gentilhomme de Molière, real acting, not Hollywood acting. <laughs> um, the, the, the value of learning a third language, my daughter is Italian, Jamaican, French, Canadian. That is how we are going to be able to engage and interact with the global community, not just from a cultural perspective, but from an economic perspective as well. So we are for this, for the very essence of who we are. Balarama is a Indian Hindu name. Wholeness is a Scottish name. My father is Jamaican. My mother is French Canadian. This is the, the nature of Montreal. And I think that we could do so all while recognizing that French is vulnerable in North America. And I think that a lot of the Frank, our Francophone friends view the contestation of Bill 96 as against the French language. And I think that's, that's inaccurate. We still understand the fragility of the French language and culture in Quebec. We want to uphold and strengthen that, but that does not mean diminishing and infringing on the rights of linguistic minorities and Anglophones. Listening to you speak, it, it sounds very much like Montreal speaking. I mean, not surprising that yes. you, your party is Bloc Montréal, but, but it is a very much, very much a Montreal reality you're speaking out of, a Montreal vision that you're putting forward, a Montreal culture ethos. It, it's very Montreal. But in the rest of Quebec, this might be met with some suspicion about, you know, your intentions, some, uh, some sense that this is arrogant Montreal trying to tell the province how to function, on and on and on. Yeah. How, do you, how do you keep this Montreal focus that you have, 
the, the Montreal experience you're speaking from not becoming a kind of source of division between people in the province, between Montreal and the regions, between people who have less experience of an intercultural reality and therefore a little bit more cons you know, concerned about the future. So is there not a risk that by so focusing on Montreal, your party and, and, your, own, and your own perspective, that it risks creating divisions in Quebec society? Yeah, and, and, and I could understand those concerns. Um, the first thing beyond Montreal is that with an aging population and baby boomer, uh, you know, dying off, the, the natural fundamental demographic shift will be immigration. So when you're in the regions, it's not just that Montreal is becoming increasingly diverse, is that the backyards of Repentigny, Chicoutimi, Gaspésie are becoming more and more diverse. And this is causing concern for uh, the Francophone majority who see not just their uh, culture eroding, but the demographics shifting. This is a, a fundamental reality. But what I would tell these, uh, these such person who is concerned is that the reality is that Le Grand Montréal, the Greater Montreal region, is 50% of Quebec's GDP and 50% of the population. And a strong Greater Montreal uh, region is going to create a stronger Gaspésie, a stronger Chicoutimi, because the industries that are prevalent in the regions will be reinforced by Montreal, who are consuming products and services from the regions. So a strong Montreal will equal a stronger regional Quebec. Okay. And that's what the... Yeah. Cool. Let's move on to the next topic, which is education. So thank you for people. Uh, thank you to folks for their questions about uh, rights and access to justice. Now we're moving on to education. Again, you can use the Q&A function uh, down there at the bottom of the screen. Um, send us your questions. Please let us know your name and where you're writing from, just so we have a good sense of who we're speaking to. Education, Bill 40. I know you touch on it on your website. You mention it in passing. No, no, nothing specific, though, that I found easily, but there, it might be there. I'm not saying it's not there. Um, Bill 40 has become a real focus for the English speaking community with respect to the future of education in the province. Um, there's other issues too, which we'll have time to touch on, like the CEGEPs, you have already alluded to Dawson and what's going on with Dawson, uh, CEGEP access. But let's focus in on school boards and protection of school boards and how, you know, where you stand on that. So, what's your perspective on Bill 40? What would you be intending to do if you get a voice in the National Assembly? Uh, well, that's close to my heart. For many reasons, one, I am a teacher. Uh, two, I did my master's in education and curriculum and instructional design. And not only should Bill 40 be abolished, but school boards and the English Montreal School Board and all English Montreal School Boards are protected under the Canadian Constitution. So that's step one. But school boards need more power over curriculum. Right now, the curriculum is created at the provincial level and the curriculum is universal across the province. But I think that school boards should have more power to create curriculum beyond lesson plans. So you can have a lesson plan that's a, that's a derivative of the curriculum, but the actual power to create curriculum at the school board level is going to be critical because right now the provincial government is attempting to change curriculum to reflect more, if you will, homogenous Quebec values in certain courses. We need to have a curriculum that's attuned to the readiness, the interest, and the preference of students right here in the Montreal region that are increasingly diverse. And it cannot be the same curriculum as that that's taught, if you will, in, in Northern Quebec. So obviously, Bill 40 is a wash. But more importantly, school boards need to have more power to be able to dictate what we teach to students to ensure that they can be competitive in a 21st century global economy. Where are you teaching now? Oh, now I'm, this is an educational moment. This, this <laughs> no, an yeah, educational no, no, moment. no, but you, but you said you're working as a teacher. Like no, no, I worked, no, so oh, I you worked, worked at, as, a I worked as a teacher. as a teacher at, in, in okay. Ottawa, Viscount Alexander. That was my career before going into law and politics. And one of the reasons why I got into law and politics is because I was a teacher in class with, with poor curriculum and no resources. And my principal had no power. And I said, how the hell am I going to fix this? 
well, it's doing this is what I'm doing today. Is how okay. I'm gonna fix this. <laughs> so, so you you come with a deep knowledge of the education system. You put out there on the table right away that you think there should be more power over curriculum at the local level through school boards. Can you give us an example or two of the kinds of things that you think should be taught in our schools or our high schools in particular yeah. that aren't being taught now in Montreal? Stronger sense of science technology, engineering, math with a basis of e-commerce that's actually bankable so that when you finish, you can actually generate revenue. Your ability to do your, your taxes and accounting at a high level, a better history curriculum that takes into consideration systemic racism, slavery, indigenous rights, the contribution of Irish, Jewish, Scottish immigrants to uh, Canadian culture and Canadian history. That's one small aspect that we should be able to teach young people. And once they graduate high school, they're form formidably, excuse me, able to co contribute to the economy right away. The current system is that once you finish high school, you don't really have tools to engage. And now all of a sudden you, you need to go to SEJEP for two or three years before going to university on a four-year program. You finish and you are 23, 24 with a sociology degree with very little ability to engage in the 21st century global economy. So we need to ensure that young people, particularly at the high school level, have the, the STEM as well as the financial literacy, as well as the cultural and historical background to have true holistic understanding of education or rather of the world in order to interact with the world. If we formed a government, I would double if not triple the budget for education to improve experiential learning. So field trips are not just to the, you know, to the sugar cabins, <laughs> quality, quality educational experiences that provide local, national, and international experience for young people to be able to see the world in private schools. I've taken students from Cairo to Ottawa and in public schools, we're going to possibly a, a museum. So by properly funding uh, our public schools, we could do a better job to equip the future generations with quality education. And that would, lastly, decrease our high school dropout rate, which is the highest in the nation. Okay, we've got a question actually about funding or connected to funding. Uh, this is from Sam in Montreal. The English public school sector after Bill 101 is now much smaller than the French private sector. Would you remove the subsidies to the private school sector? And, uh, you know, this is a policy I advocated for back in, in 20, uh, 2017. Um, in 2017, it was $500 million subsidy that was going to the private sector um it's it's difficult because i'm advocating and i would advocate for private schools to be able to manage their own affairs um now the question that we would have is that by removing the subsidy from the private schools and taking and putting that into the public schools uh, what detrimental effect would that have on private schools and we'd have to have assessments and, and, and consultations about that. Because there are some private schools that provide subsidies for low income students to attend these private schools. So I think that most, you know, most politicians would have a firm answer for you and say, yes, cut the 500 million. That was my position in 2017. I said, you know what, we need to remove that. But the public system is so broken that putting that $500 million into the public school system would be uh, a drop in, in the ocean. I think that rather than take from the private system right now, I think that we should take a hard look at how we're funding the public school system. And I think that in Quebec, that $500 million, in my view, given our current budget, you know, we mentioned Montreal's a $200 billion GDP. I think it's fine. Okay, so let's um, continuing on questions about education. Yes. Uh, this one from Andre from downtown, uh, and this is about second language teaching. As a teacher and uh, or someone who's experienced the, the 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 reality of our school system, do you feel the teaching of English and French as a second language is a, is enough of a priority in Quebec in the Quebec school system? It's not a priority because it doesn't begin at the daycare level. 
if it was a priority, all daycares would have the uh, uh, all daycares would have English and French teachers in daycares. Also, and this is very very important, le le vérificateur général of Quebec in 2017 released a report, and I'll send it off to QCGN after, that said that the provincial government and the ministry responsible for teaching second language or French to new immigrants was an utter failure. What that means is when immigrants would come to Canada or come to Quebec, and the Ministry of Immigration would provide them with French courses, well, there was lack, lacking funding, not enough teachers, no follow-up, poor assessments, and the new immigrants were not learning French. So not only are the public school systems not giving enough attention to English and French, also newcomers, when they arrive here, are not given the tools necessary to learn French. So you have to strengthen your public school system to ensure that you, you provide enough resources and teachers and materials. Mm -hmm. And also the ministry, right now it's called, the before it was called the Ministry of Integration, Diversity and Inclusion. Now it's called the Ministry de la Francisation, needs more resources to ensure that we provide the tools for newcomers to learn French. Okay, um, let's move on to another question. And this actually touches back. You've already mentioned it in your opening remarks and we've, and I, and I said we'd get to it, but here it comes as a question from one of our viewers, one of our listeners. How will you push to ensure the expansion of Dawson College and how will you ensure the continued viability of regional English CEGEPs? This comes from Stephen in Mont saint -Hilaire. Okay, so Mont saint -Hilaire, and and that's a good point is because we see, we see Francois Legault is putting in a policy that might help you. Uh, sorry, what was his name? Was? Stephen. Stephen. So right now, there's a new policy that that came into to play by the um, by the CAC administration that is providing international students with reduced tuitions if they study in the regions, and if this is successful and this law has passed. What it means is that the English, uh, English universities or CEGEPs beyond Montreal will be a, a magnet for international students because they're going to be able to uh, get uh, you know, cheaper education. So oh. I'm not too worried about that yet. Okay, Dawson, let's get to Dawson. Then. Yeah, now, now Dawson, we launched our campaign um, on the day, on, on that Monday at Dawson. And the reason why we did that is because we wanted to bring attention to the fact that the expansion program of Dawson uh, was cut. I believe it's 11,000 square feet that needs to be expanded. And this goes right at the heart of Bill 96. Why? It's because it's not about protecting French. It's about attacking English language rights, and English language institutions, whether it's a school board or a CEGEP. And this is why, this is, this is our, our lifeblood. This is why we announced at Dawson College is because we feel as though it's not just Anglophones that will be impacted, Francophone students who want to engage the global international world through business, through uh, science, you name it, they want to attend uh, quality English CEGEPs and capping it, I think, at 17.5% is not a quality um, language policy. And we are surely for the expansion of Dawson and to reignite uh, the funding that's supposed to go to Dawson and, and many other uh, English CEGEPs that are probably on the chopping block down the line. Okay, thank you to everyone with their questions about education. We need to move on because time is 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 uh, is, is is passing quickly here uh, with uh, with Balarama Holness, who is the leader of Bloc Montréal. Our third topic, Mr. Holness, is health and social services. So once again, please send us your questions about health and social services. Make sure to include your name and where you're writing from, because uh, that's helpful to us. So, Mr. Holness, for your party, what are the priorities in in health and social services? services and obviously we're thinking specifically about access for English speaking Quebecers to quality services um, but not just the services that already exist uh, to to even better services um, and maybe sometimes for some people just 
services, plain and simple, given yes. the, 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 you know, what, what's happening in our emergency wards and what's happening in terms of people not having access to family physicians, so on and so on. So what are the priorities for your party with respect to HNSS? Yeah, and this is uh, our number one priority in terms of our platform. Right now, there are 650,000 people waiting for a family doctor right here in Montreal. Uh, there are 160,000 uh, surgeries on backlog. And right now, the provincial government put in this program called Le Prem which takes doctors that could be practicing in Montreal, but provides them only with permits of practice in the regions. So there are some areas in the regions that have up to 90% of the population have access to family doctors. Here in Montreal, it's about 60, between 65 and 69%. So we want to abolish this PREM program, ensure that doctors can practice right here in Montreal. We have to expand uh, access to McGill Medicine, which is very, very exclusionary, and other med schools provide subsidies for students who want to practice medicine, ensure that we get more doctors into the system, and then ensure that those doctors could practice in Montreal. We also, we're, we're thinking very closely about the long-term care homes during the pandemic, the epicenter of COVID-19 surely was Montreal North and right now, but why was it Montreal North? Because of the long-term care homes that did not have access to quality care. We had to actually get the army to come into our hospitals and our long-term care homes. The, uh, the ventilation and air quality system needs to be completely redone in all these regions. And this is also linked last but not least to immigration. We have to facilitate and accelerate the recognition of the um, diplomas of international workers when they come here, whether they are nurses or other healthcare professionals, to ensure that they can actually contribute uh, to um, reducing the burden on the current healthcare system. During the pandemic, we did tap into that, that base. And now we're actually uh, taking these same people that helped us during the pandemic and literally shipping them back to their country. So we need to ensure that we actually have a more humane and tolerant way of how we address um, some of these immigrants. And they are going to be the ones, as mentioned, with the baby boomer population that are gonna uphold and, and uh, fulfill um, the, the quality of healthcare services that we have right now in Montreal and in Quebec. As you probably know, um, the extent to which English-speaking Quebecers have access to services in English in Montreal and in all the regions depends on uh, so-called access plans, whereby local health authorities develop you know, a whole structure where they identify specifically the kinds of services, the specific services that need to be or should be or will be available in English. Those access plans, at least the latest versions of them, have been stalled for months, for years in Quebec City as they fought back and forth over exactly what should be in it and when's the right time and so on and so forth. Um, do you know about the access plans? What are you intending to do to try and get those access plans adopted and respected as expeditiously as possible? Yeah, and so that ties into Bill 96, right? So we've the CAC government established that having access to health services in English will not be barred. And in the legislation, it's clearly stated that it will be barred. So that, that, while that's important, it's the least of our words currently because we do not know if a doctor is going to simply not communicate in English to an English patient. So I'll just end there. Okay, um, so let's go to our questions because we do have one now and this touches back on the point about access to family doctors to your GP uh, from Anna in Dorval. Where do you stand on every Quebecer having the right to a family doctor? Is it even possible given the, the, the complexities of the system but also the complexities of training up enough doctors um, quickly enough to, to ensure Quebecers have the kind of access that, uh, that many Quebecers feel they should have? Yeah, and We've, we've also used, that, that's a strong word to use, a right to a doctor. So the right to housing, which means that if the government would not provide you with housing, the government would be liable. So I, I don't think that in any, in the near term future, having access to a doctor will be a right. While it should be, we would love it to be, 
But what we wanted to establish is, and it's similar, <clears throat> unfortunately, to what the CAC, I think the CAC stole it from, from us, is that <laughs> we want to ensure that we take the burden off of the current, the current public system and provide an element of private care. So for example, the Jewish General Hospital would have, uh, you'd be able to purchase insurance and there would be a section whereby you can go get your service um, with a private, a private uh, distributor, if you will, or insurer, and that would access, that provide you with more access. And right now what's happening is that we're pumping billions into this public system, but we're not getting the services in return. Right now you can wait 24, 48 hours for care. Sometimes you don't get care. When you call the emergency, they tell you not to come in. So you need to ensure that we provide, we have a quasi public private system and we are advocating for this Dutch model. We can get more details on blockmontreal.com to ensure you increase competitiveness, increase innovation, and provide some, um, some more, I would say, accountability in a system right now that's clearly broken. Okay, this sounds like when we were speaking to Eric Zuem last week. Um, here, it, it's not so much the CAC, it's, it's, it's the conservatives that are talking about radically enhancing the role of the private sector, or at least substantially enhancing the role of the private sector. So this is clearly your policy now. You are for private health care. You want a mix of public and private. <laughs> Are you a journalist? Because no, I, didn't say, not, uh, I didn't say radically. I didn't say no. No, what I we, mean what we're saying is that there are some there are some elements. So, say for example, you broke your pinky, right? Should you be going to the emergency, or should you be going to a different sector of a hospital that provides you with the services that you need without? clogging up the emergency healthcare system well right, and, you know? and, and putting my money down to pay for it right in addition to the to the taxes i already pay for the public system so sure i could go there but if i have the money or the private sector insurance policy that'll yeah. pay for it and if i don't have the money and i don't have the insurance policy i gotta sit there in the in the in the emergency room for for two days waiting for my pinky to be looked at exactly it doesn't and, sound and fair to me you know, and, and people would have a choice. And that's what we've established very clearly in our platform. And that's the, the Dutch model is people would have a choice. But what's the choice and, if I don't have the money to pay for private health care? Well, like that's not... yeah, and that's a great point. And, and the current the current choice is what we have now, which is that you have no choice. And what we're advocating for is simply saying that right now the current system is broken. And if you remove some people from the public system, you are going to facilitate those who actually enter into the public system and, and get the care that they need. Okay. So what you're doing is, you're yes, you have to pay, but you are removing the individuals from the public system into the private system. And the, the, the solution is, the, the solution could be, we continue to pump billions into the current system. And that for us, we're saying that is not decreasing wait times, and the Dutch model and what we're advocating for, there's more information on our website, as mentioned. Okay, a uh, question from Sam. Uh, how do you plan to stop the exodus of doctors and nurses to other provinces and countries? That's a, that's a, great, a great issue. Right now, there are doctors that we've spoken to that feel as though they're, they're making not minimum wage, but they're, they're, they're not doing very well. Also, the mental health aspect and the, the pressure from the pandemic and everything that the, not just doctors, but also nurses had to deal with was extremely difficult. Quality of work conditions can be improved by getting more doctors to come into the system. And as we mentioned before, ensuring that our med schools open their doors to get more individuals to come into the system and Montreal and Quebec still have a lot to offer in terms of quality of life, in terms of transportation, in terms of housing, if you compare it to Ontario or compare it to BC. So by getting more people into the system and into our medical uh, system, you can ensure that they're going to be, uh, more people will be remaining and working in Quebec and in Montreal. Okay, time is passing. We got to move on. Thanks to everybody for their questions on health and social services. The last 
theme that we're going to be picking up right now with Mr. Holness is the vitality of Quebec's English speaking community. Again, we'd like your questions on that theme. Uh, use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Send us your questions with your name and where you're writing from. Mr. Holness, vitality of, of Quebec's English speaking community. I think people were a bit heartened by some of the latest um, statistics from St Statistics Canada from the census that suggested that numbers aren't sliding the way they have over the last couple of decades. But um, the vitality of the community, its ability to continue as a strong presence in Quebec society is a real one. What would you do to encourage the English speaking community to contribute in some way to its vitality and its ability to survive and prosper here? For sure. Well, one of the great ways to do it, uh, many people might be wondering why, why does Balarama Holness keep running for office, right? I ran for mayor and now I'm running again. One of the ways that we contribute to uh, the livelihood of the English speaking community in Quebec and in Montreal is to tirelessly and endlessly and optimistically engage our democracy. It is one of the best ways that we could stand up for our rights. And what I'm hearing some people was, was kind of disheartening, <laughs> like uh, DJ Khaled would say, it breaks my heart, is that people are saying, I want to move out the province. And that's not the way to do it. Whether you are an artist, whether you are a teacher, whether you are a stay-at-home mom or a stay-at-home dad, whether you are a municipal uh, elected official, is that we all have to stay here in Montreal, in Quebec together and keep standing up for our rights. And whether it was the 80s with the referendum, the first referendum, or I believe it's 95, the second referendum. And, and now we're at another turning point with Bill 96. And I think that now more than ever, it's time to come together and to ensure that we have discussions just like we're having here today. And it's the, the little things we do as individuals <clears throat> and by banding together that we're going to ensure that we uphold and protect our rights. <clears throat> and the last thing we, we need to do is to allow um, a soft liberal party who simply wants to remove the notwithstanding clause to be our spokespersons. You know, Colin Standish is a better spokesperson for English speaking rights than Dominique Anglade is. Kudos to him. And others who are stepping up to say, you know what? We are going to stand up for our rights regardless of the mountain that we see in, in front of us. Um, so that is how I believe that we can improve our livelihood and, and improve uh, our chances of survival amongst the onslaught of Bill 40, Bill 96, uh, 32 and others, and more are coming as, as we know. And down the line, last but not least, there could be a referendum. And the last thing we need is an exodus now and a separation from the rest of Canada. So sticking together now is more important than ever. Okay, let's circle back. We do have a question and this kind of circles back to education. It circles back to the conversation about Bill 101, but it does have a lot to do with the ability of the community to renew itself. And that is the question of access to English language schools. As you know, Mr. Holness, at this, at this point, the only guaranteed access to the school is through the so-called Canada Clause, whereby if you've had you know, most of your primary schooling in English somewhere in Canada and you move here to Quebec, you have the right through the via the Canada Clause um, to have access to, to, to English language schools schools. There has been conversations over the years, most notably led by Greta Chambers uh, when she was looking into this issue, the so-called Chambers report saying that that kind of approach should be expanded worldwide. So if you come here, no matter where you come from, and you had your education in English, that your kids should have access to English language schools. Where do you stand on that? Should we expand access to our schools as our primary community institution um, in, in order for the community to be able to renew itself the way the French speaking community can renew itself through immigration? Yeah, um, and, and this is where, this is how I, I don't describe myself as a politician because sometimes I say the things that are, that are not as popular. Um, as you can see, my English is pretty good, right? Uh, um, my mother tongue is English. Uh, when I, you know, I, I was born in Montreal. I moved away from Montreal at the age of one, came back when I was 10. 
and I was obliged to go to a French school. Mm -hmm. And that significantly enriches my ability to, to intermingle and communicate with the world, particularly in Montreal. So when I say I'm bilingual, you know, my opponent, Colin Standard, says he's bilingual. He could barely speak French. He, he, he could not be speak at a French debate. I gave him a, a, an applause. So I might as well give him a little shot. Right? <laughs> um, now, now, as a parent, coming from a, and, and I'll, I'll give you a little asterisk here, as a parent, when I am arriving to Canada or to Quebec, and I, my, my first language is English, the fact that my son or daughter has to go to a French school, ça crée un individu qui est parfaitement bilingue, qui peut opérer dans les deux langues, qui peut faire un débat politique, se lancer pour la mairie en français et débattre tous les enjeux en français. Mm -hmm. Il peut faire son droit à McGill en français s'il si veut. Mm -hmm. Et avoir une capacité de parler une langue à un niveau exceptionnel, mais c'est un bénéfice. So, what I what so we would say that you know this would be non-issue. However, however, when it comes to asylum seekers, refugees, people fleeing war zones, such as from Ukraine, the last thing they need is to go to a, a French school second language when they're completely have gone through devastation. So there are exceptions to the rule. But overall, I think that we would be we would be strengthened as an English community with our ability to speak multiple language and equality of French. And I'll end on this. Yeah. The Gazette has identified, you know, myself and Dominique Anglade and Colin as top three advocates for English language uh, proponents. But all of us speak French. So the stronger the English community can master French and communicate our message, the stronger uh, our rights and our livelihood as English speaking Quebecers will be. And it would be hypocritical, last but not least, to say that not speaking French or not going to French schools would somehow diminish our English language nature, because that is the same argument that the CAC is using for French. Okay, I want to get in one last very quick question. Hope a quick answer too. This is about uh, representation of English speaking people in the Quebec uh, civil service, which as you perhaps know, is somewhere under 1% percent of yes. the of this of of the public service even though we represent something approaching 14 percent of the population yeah. do you think that that underrepresentation represents in some way systemic discrimination against english-speaking quebecers absolutely and we've addressed this during the public consultation on systemic racism and discrimination language was a barrier what we need to do is and this is across the board public and private sector you have to remove the french evaluation that you could learn French once you're in the workplace. What's happening is that they're giving stringent French exams that even Francophone Quebecers would not pass and barring individuals from entering into the workforce. This is not just um, uh, discrimination in terms of language, but employment discrimination. And we need to ensure that we eliminate French evaluations, allow Anglophones to contribute to the workforce. And once they get into the workforce, they could learn French in the public or private sector. Thank you to Sam for that last question. And Sylvia, I forgot to mention that you gave us that good question about the Canada Clause. So thanks to everybody who provided questions for us. Now, Mr. Holos, wanted to give you your last up to three minutes just for a wrap up here. Well, thank you so much, everyone who's tuned in. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing you um, in your community, seeing you on the road and in parks. And this is a great moment to not just engage our democracy, but speak your truth at the voting uh, ballot box. Uh, it's not about voting for Bloc Montreal or the Canadian Party or for the Liberals. You're going to make your choice. But whatever that choice is, I hope you vote with your values and vote for the party that's aligned to your policies. Don't think about vote splitting or think about the, how what the political pundits want to twist. Vote with your values vote for the party that you think is going to best represent you and give you a voice at the National Assembly. Thanks, Mr. Hull. It's been a real pleasure speaking with you. Let me hand it back to Ava for a more formal thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Holness. Uh, you allowed us to get to know you better, and we appreciate that. Thank you. 
And I particularly appreciate your last words about the importance of voting. Uh, we at QCGN are, encourage all members of the English speaking community to vote, very important. And to make your videos and put them on social media saying why we should be voting. And on that note, I say good night to everybody. And there is a debate going on right now. So you may want to watch on, on uh, TVA. Thank you and good night. Thank you.